Experience is important to any celebrity's rise and function. Without an enraptured and supportive audience, celebrities would be just like the rest of us. Writer P. David Marshall argued that, quote, celebrity is an acknowledgement of the public's power. Take internet meme star and rapper Danielle Brigoli, also known as Bad Baby, aka Cash Me Outside. There are thousands of ill-tempered and culturally appropriating white teenagers online, but Danielle's stardom was secured by the public via social media, who shared her infamous appearance on Dr. Phil millions of times and engaged in the antics that followed. Somewhere, a girl exactly like Danielle Brigoli sits non-famous and without lucrative endorsement deals because she never was seen by the right audience. But hold on, I'm getting ahead of myself. If you have one, do me a favor and think about your favorite celebrity, whether they're an actress, singer, YouTuber, model, designer, or author. How much do you love them? Does the extent of your love cover lustful fantasies, merchandise purchases, and social media interactions? Or does it mean defending them against endless criticism, adopting their style, or even ignoring their worst behavior? Would you cheat on your current partner with your celebrity crush even if you knew your partner wouldn't be okay with it? Would you commit a violent crime for your fave? Would you help your favorite cover up a violent crime? When does celebrity adoration cross over into what has come to be known as celebrity worship syndrome? If you're one of those people who doesn't have a celebrity fave and you pride yourself on not engaging in gossip, before you congratulate yourself for being so evolved, first, you should understand that the reasons most of society engages in celebrity worship and gossip are layered and varied. Historian Susan J. Douglas and Andrea McDonald point out in their book Celebrity a history of fame, that studies show that gossip, despite its trivial reputation and negative connotations, actually serves important functions, such as encouraging bonding and camaraderie among friends and family members. It can also allow us to release stress, share ideas, and strengthen friendships. Via gossip, society sketches standards of shared morality and revises, or outright denies, what is and what isn't acceptable behavior. As the authors noted, when we judge celebrities and find fault in their actions, we have the opportunity to affirm our own moral codes or punish deviants, thus creating and reinforcing boundaries around our own moral frameworks. Celebrities also serve as a stand-in for current and long-running socio-political discourse and tensions. For example, when many black people rushed to defend O.J. Simpson in 1994, a lot of the support came from long-simmering disgust with the justice system and accusations of rape and violence by black men. Or recall that New York actor feud we discussed in a short history of American celebrity. Supporters of one actor rallied around his American heritage and lower class status, allowing them to project their nativist beliefs and class solidarity, while the British actor resonated with the elites and British people. Supporting one actor could be seen as taking a political stance. Speaking of politics, another thing feeding our obsession with celebrities is that unlike politics and current affairs, which can be alienating, or let's face it, boring, gossip about celebrities allows people to judge and offer opinions without much thinking. You don't have to be right when it comes to celebrity commentary. There is no complex formula, method, or studying involved. Just a quick eyeball of the current gossip and an addition of your own two cents based on your own beliefs, lifestyle, and experiences. As for the people we choose to spend so much time talking about, one study pointed out evolutionary biologists say it's natural for humans to look up to individuals who receive attention because they have succeeded in society. In prehistoric times, this would have meant respecting good hunters and elders. But as hunting is now not an essential skill and longevity is more widely achievable, these qualities are no longer revered. Instead, we look to celebrities whose fame and fortune we want to emulate. An evolutionary biologist countered that it's more about entertainment, stating, we're fascinated even when we don't go out of our way to copy them. So already we have two different reasons for the growing power of celebrities. A desire to be entertained by them and a desire to emulate them. So let's talk about the three-tiered celebrity worship scale created by psychoanalysts in 2002. There are low worship people who watch and read about celebrities and are motivated by sensation seeking and entertainment. Intermediate celeb worshipers more broadly
proudly integrate their favorite celebrities' personalities into their own lives, using them as social cues. Meanwhile, high celebrity worship was described as excessive empathy with the celebrity's successes and failures, over-identifying with the celebrity, and obsessively following the details of a celebrity's life. This sounds like a lot of people, which is probably why the celebrity worship scale evolved into the celebrity attitude scale, and the categories had more detailed metrics. Low worship became entertainment social, denoting that people in this category see celebrities as commodifiable and consumable products for their own entertainment. Intermediate became intense personal, describing the people who take social cues from celebrities and use them as a source of self-esteem or personality. These are the people who wear outfits like their faves, adopt their slang, purchase products they endorse, etc. High celebrity worship became borderline pathological and involved people with violent or unrealistic fantasies involving celebrities that could lead to dangerous behavior like stalking or as a metric in the study stated for respondents to agree with their dispute. If I were lucky enough to meet my favorite celebrity and he or she asked me to do something illegal as a favor, I would probably do it. Borderline pathological behavior could include people who get plastic surgery to look exactly like their favorite celebrity on the soft end or someone like Yolanda Saldivar. You probably remember her as the murderer of Selena. Big year, Selena. She won uh, El Grammy. Una cosa yo creo was like a dream come true, verdad? Exactly. Tell us about it. Yolanda was a fan who begged Selena's father to allow her to start a fan club and she embezzled money. When she was discovered and fired, she felt so betrayed by her favorite celebrity's dismissal that she shot her. Another example of a dangerous stan is John Hinckley Jr., who became so obsessed with Jodie Foster after seeing her in Taxi Driver that he attempted to assassinate Reagan to impress her. Hinckley had what is now referred to as erotomania, in which a deluded person falsely believes a person is in love with them. This is the reason for many celebrity stands who turn to stalking. Sociologist Josh Gameson came up with another way to categorize those who engage in celebrity culture, and this scale even includes some people who may claim to hate it. Let's say there are three friends. Traditional Tina believes all positive gossip about her favorite celebrities and everything negative about celebrities she despises. She's unaware of the industry of celebrity production, publicity, social media management, investors, etc., instead believing that Fame is an organic recognition of internal gifts and that famous people are worthy of special treatment because of it. She's the friend who gobbles up charitable publicity stunts and photo opportunities and consumes pop culture uncritically. Next up is second order traditionalist Tasha, who isn't ignorant of celebrity production. She knows about the team of writers, stylists, publicists, and marketing execs that makes Beyonce Beyonce, but she still appreciates Beyonce's talent and supports her. She finds inspiration in his escapism in Beyonce, but she also acknowledges that she is a lucrative consumer of Beyonce the brand. This nuanced perspective means that she would be more willing to question celebrities in politics than someone like traditional Tina. Then there's anti-believer Akira, who Gameson labels a post-modernist. Akira knows about the production of celebrities, so she enjoys to seek out evidence of celebrity production to dismiss all ascension to fame or any type of gossip about celebrities as fake and contrived. When Meg Thee Stallion broke up with Moneybag Yo or post photos of her with various high-profile men sparking internet discourse, think pieces, and music streams, someone like traditional Tina calls Meg a hoe or defends her against accusations of being a hoe because she perceives the press around Meg to be 100% authentic. She takes her celebrity debates seriously and gets emotionally invested in them. Meanwhile, Akira would declare Meg's sole intention to be publicity. In the middle is Tasha, who believes that whether or not Meg is trying to engage her audience with good gossip, there's no harm in chatting about it for entertainment value. This spectrum shows that not everyone engages in celebrity culture passively. Back in the 40s, critics were skeptical that radio, movies, and magazines would damage fans' abilities to see the world critically and categorize all fans as passive consumers, an idea that didn't change until the 1980s with the introduction of Gameson's Spectrum. In a short 
history of celebrity, I mentioned that movie screens, radios, and TVs created a sense of familiarity between the public and stars. Innovations in media tech have provided us with more illusions of intimacy with celebrities, especially for the younger generation because they're always on their phones. For instance, you can tune into your favorite rapper or singer on Instagram Live and even have a chance to see them reply to you in real time on Twitter. For fans who belong in the intense personal category or who are traditionalists, it's easy to see why stand culture grows exponentially. For a growing number of teens and young adults reared on in-your-face celebrity culture, being a stand is normalized. Studies have linked obsessive celebrity worship to poor body image in adolescents, an increased chance of obtaining plastic surgery, and a personality style characterized by sensation-seeking, cognitive rigidity, identity diffusion, and poor interpersonal boundaries. Basically, stands are more likely to be attention-obsessed, close-minded, unsure about their own identity, and socially awkward and or nosy. Studies have also linked high levels of celebrity worship to poor mental health, depression, anxiety, and social dysfunction. When you think about it, this is the antithesis of the lifestyle sold by many celebrities in their marketing and branding. You know, the good vibes only, confident, carefree, life is good, money brings me happiness mentality. Up until now, I've alluded to the production of celebrities quite a bit. A major thing exacerbating stand culture is the actual industry behind celebrities. You know capitalism has something to do with this, right? Celebrity production is an industry that relies on various workers, from hairstylists to lawyers to catering companies to choreographers to songwriters to executive producers. Billions, if not trillions of dollars, are generated through the commodification of celebrity in various fields. In this theory, celebrity are commodities that serve as sources of capital that can be discarded when they lose their value in order to make room for someone else. Producing and maintaining celebrities through various money avenues, product endorsement, movies, albums, etc., is lucrative for everybody involved. Because celebrities are so profitable for various people and corporations, little regard is paid to the ethics of celebrity production. This brings us back to the underage Danielle Brigoli, whose handlers push stories about her being involved with adult men or her outlandish behavior more than they do her music. Or you can think about highly violent celebrities who prosper because of how lucrative they are. Or how hella people covered up for Harvey Weinstein because his role in the celebrity production machine put money in their own pockets. Here you can also turn your attention to the numerous child and teen stars who were fed through the Hollywood machine, who were financially, sexually, physically, or mentally abused without anybody doing anything about it. The sickest part is that even when they're dumped on the side of the road, Road as has-beens with drug problems or mental health issues, they're still a profitable part of the industry. Gossip sites, tabloid magazines, and TV shows alone are a $3 billion industry. Controversy drives gossip and attracts audiences, both negative and positive. The fame industry then capitalizes on that audience, despite any harmful effects of doing so. Because celebrities are so profitable, the goal for the industry is to build an audience, and this usually doesn't happen organically. The desire for profit doesn't doesn't leave room for blackballing racists, rapists, or woman beaters. Instead, there are photo shoots, marketing campaigns, press opportunities, publication features, public philanthropy, and other things. Again, involving a litter of people paid to help produce and promote content that makes such people more appealing. These things not only build the celebrity and repair their reputations even when they don't deserve it, but creates illusions of intimacy for the fans. Fan itself is derived from the Latin word fanaticus, which means insanely but divinely inspired. As we discussed earlier, the celebrity is nothing without their audience, so the fame industry uses every available opportunity to create insanely loyal fans who in turn keep the celebrity profitable. A lot of people use stan colloquially to mean adoration or support, not the crazy, obsessive, potentially lethal stan coined by Eminem in 2000. But celebrity worship disorder is real. Celebrity worship is the result of faux intimacy and celebrity commodification gone too far. In addition to people like the crazed man who broke into Rihanna's home on numerous occasions, we know this because people send death threats and hate speech to others over a difference in opinion about their favorite celebrities. People find joy in dragging the unfortunate souls who dare critique their faves. Standom is most evident in certain professions. Psychologist Mark D. Griffith noted, any person who is in the public eye can be the object of a person's obsession, authors, politicians, journalists, but research and criminal prosecutions suggest they are more likely to be someone from the world of television, film, and or pop music.
Stan culture, remarkably, can also be theorized as a reaction to the fall of religious influence. As the power of religious institutions has waned over the past half century, people still look for something bigger than themselves to admire or aspire to. Writer Chris Rajik said, As with gods, we can project intensely positive, even worshipful feelings onto celebrities. And this connection can compensate for feelings of invalidation and incompleteness somewhere in their lives. Now, some stands are anarchists or sadists who enjoy cruel, problematic behavior. Think followers of 50 Cent or Tommy Laren. But what about good people who support celebs with toxic traits? A religious kind of relationship with celebrities would explain why stands find it so hard to acknowledge when their faves do something wrong, creative talents aside. For instance, I know people who abhor male rape apologists, but give free passes to Nicki Minaj, who has supported her rapist brother, worked with a rapist, and married a rapist. Check the court documents before you come for me in the comments. Because of close feelings of intimacy they have for her, they let this go. She's a talented woman who's worked hard to get to her spot. They felt all of her losses and they feel like proud parents whenever she wins. They are emotionally attached because they feel like they know her and can be happy through her. A friend mentioned how Nikki has gotten her through hard times and inspired her at her lowest points, something one before the 20th century would usually say about God. Then there are others who continue to stand Nikki because of shared identities, whether organic or imagined. Think of the island girls who love her heritage, those who have suffered with substance abuse, or those who have been emulating her persona for so long that to deviate from it would be painful and would leave them confused about who they really are. This isn't exclusive to Nicki Minaj. The racist Jeffree Star maintains a loyal, mostly white and queer fan base that excuses his behavior because he serves as their representation. If someone bases their entire personality off of someone with toxic patterns of trash behavior and attitudes, wouldn't acknowledging that person's flaws require a hard look at one's own identity? And aren't people pretty bad at self-reflecting as it is? John Fisk introduced the concept of semiotic productive fans, people who use celebrities to construct their own identity or enhance it as a form of empowerment, usually in opposition to the status quo. Think about stands of fat positive Lizzo or sex positive Madonna in the 80s. Or even more commonly, we can think about the way the black community tends to celebrate black celebrity victories at award shows or the box office as a win for the community, even if those things do nothing for structural race racism, poverty, and mass incarceration. This brings me to the last celebrity worship theory we'll discuss today. Celebrity worship in America can be further theorized as a facet of neoliberalism. Neoliberals make no room for structural and institutional inequalities or conversations about privilege, and celebrities who now come from all facets of life embody the bootstrap narratives neoliberals and conservatives hold near and dear. Additionally, celebrity philanthropy validates neoliberal ideas that the government doesn't need to be responsible for poverty. Susan J. Douglas and Andrea McDonald explain the sentiment thusly. If we have so many celebrities giving to or championing private foundations or non-governmental organizations, do we really need government programs to support the sick and needy? Stan culture has infiltrated both sides of American politics. People are dedicating themselves to politicians instead of viewing them through a nuanced lens. But the danger of stan culture is perhaps best represented by the ascension of Donald Trump to the presidency. If your favorite celebrity can do no wrong, and must be protected from critique or consequences at all costs. Who can stop them if they move from somewhat controversial fame to political puppet or tyrant? Want to see more great long format videos like this? Well, you can, over on Patreon, where a one to three dollar monthly pledge grants you access to exclusive videos and essays. Plus, your pledge produces more great free content like this. Check the link in the description box below for more information. Also, be sure to like this video and subscribe.